Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in the study that we've been, just started a couple of weeks ago, in Paul's second letter to Timothy. So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to pick up on verse 6 where we left off last week. But before we do that, Mark is going to ask God's blessing upon our time together. And I pray that it's together. Hallelujah. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And that is a pretty powerful statement. So Lord, we ask you to sanctify you as Lord in our lives and Lord in our hearts. And just tell us what to speak, what to say, what to do to for your kingdom lord and we're studying your word just let us glean out of it what you want us to glean out of it and for it to show your love of the cross amen amen okay we're in verse six as we ended last week as i said we're talking about Paul's admonition to Timothy to kindle afresh the gift of God, right? And kindle means to stir up a fire, right? And keep that fire going. A fire will, of its nature, uh, if it's left to its own devices, will go out. It'll, it'll burn out when it's consumed all the fuel or lost the heat, or if it is loses the air moving through it. Those are the three things that a fire requires. It has to have fuel, it has to have heat, and it has to have air. So we, we did pretty uh, thorough a study on those first two ones, on the fuel for a fire mm -hmm. and on uh, the heat. And that's, as I said there last week, and by the way, if you missed last week, it's probably worth your while to go back and, and watch that program to catch up with us. And it's there on the Bible Talk website. But I wanted to talk about the last one of those three things, and that's the air. Okay, a fire cannot survive without air. That's why with electrical fires, by the way, I mean, all they do is they, they smother them, usually like with a foam or something, it, it starves the fire for oxygen. Or either CO2, which does the same, same thing. thing. Same thing. Right? So, so what is the wind? The wind is the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Ruach, the breath of God. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. I was going to talk about it in just a minute, oh. but it's all right, you didn't. It? Okay. You know, this is one of the things here in the United States of America. Um, it is not uncommon to have some pretty horrific wildfires, mm -hmm. particularly out towards the West Coast. And one of the reasons for that is there's a lot of forest land there. Mm -hmm. But the other reason is that the winds, particularly this uh, yeah. wind called the El Nino that comes in mm -hmm. off of the Pacific Ocean. And that wind will fan the flames of that fire and just make them outrageous. So, you know, the things that a firefighter prays for when they go out there is they pray for rain would be good and no wind. Okay. We, on the other hand, we need that mighty Russian wind, right? When the day of Pentecost had come, it says in Acts 2, they, all those believers, they were, they were to, all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. That wind, that holy wind, what holy fire. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God, the breath of God, grew, blew through the assembled saints, and a fire started that the world can't put out. Hallelujah. Okay. And they have tried. They, they continue to try. As much as they probably, they desperately desire to put out the fire. Because that fire that I'm talking about, is it says our God is a consuming fire. The enemy does not want the presence of God. So if he can put out the fire, he's effectively removed God. But he, but he can't put out that fire. Uh, unquenchable. Unquenchable fire. So when that fire started there on that day of Pentecost, there was some excitement in Jerusalem, I'll tell you what, all right? So the question becomes, is there excitement in our lives today? Do we fan the flames? 
Well, I can say fire. Somebody asked me just the other day, how many, you know, what, what denomination we, we belong to. I, we've not been denominational by choice since uh, basically we got saved. since we got saved. Even though I went to a mainline seminary to check some stuff out and did graduate work there, and uh, what I am is excited. I want to be excited about the Lord. Okay. And serious. You know, one more thing about fires. Uh, put more than one log on, and it burns. You put two logs on, and the fire seems to be big, more than twice the size. And that that heat is held between the two logs better. So the more logs that are on the fire, the hotter the fire, the longer it lasts. So the more fuel, the more fuel it has. And the body, same, that's, and the the same unity, with us. that's the unity in the body of Christ. So it says for us to come not, together. It is not united. Okay. You can listen to all this technical stuff. We have a dear brother in the Lord. He's been part of this ministry. I, I think uh, he got saved and came into our Bible study back in New York back in like 1976 or 1977. Uh, and he, his name is Bob, Bob Rizzoni. And Bob has been involved in alternative heating for, for more years than that. And, and he is well known and renowned. I mean, he's an expert in alternative heating. He owns a company up in upstate New York, and that's what they do. They install fireplaces, wood stoves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's called Holy Smoke. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. Fire. Uh, stove. I got to remember the name of the company. I used to be on the board of directors. Stove, fireplace, and chimney. Because yeah. that's what they specialize in. I should get Bob to come down and do this part of the study. Right. Because he is an expert on that. But he'll tell you. I mean, these things. It's you, What you want to do, you want to keep that fire going. Right. right? And what we want is a roaring blaze. Mm. I mean, I'm not looking for a little match in the darkness. I'm looking for a roaring blaze because our God is a consuming yes. fire. So, yeah, you, gotta, you want to put as much fuel on it as you can. And that is the fuel, we talked about this again last week, is us. But it's the believers. I mean, it's us. We offer ourselves a living and holy sacrifice. Okay. Um, but it requires that, requires that holy smoke. So I was going to say, we're not denominational. Somebody asked me what denomination I was because they, I, you know, I go out and teach. As a matter of fact, Alice and I will be going out here in the not too distant future to go spend another period of time over in the United Kingdom to travel around where we've ministered many, many times for a long time. And so, who do I minister to? Whoever God puts in front of my face, I'll tell you what. But I've had the opportunity, both in the United Kingdom, here in the States, and over in Africa. And, to, to do a lot of pastors' conferences, to teach a lot of pastors. And I want that excitement. The problem is, we go into a lot of churches. I'm trying to think of how to say this nicely. They look like a bunch of pickle faces. They look like a bunch of sour pickles. I don't, I don't see any excitement of Jesus Christ. There was a little girl that said it very succinctly when asked, why she went to one church instead of the other? She went, came to our, our church in New, in New York. She didn't go to the other one. When she was asked why she didn't want to go to the other one, she said, because it's too boring. That's the, that's that's the opposite. That's that was the right. size. Little girl, she was like seven years old. That's right. And she was coming to our fellowship. And uh, the, I don't want to give it away, but the priest from the, the, where she was going to school came, and I knew this guy pretty well. And he asked her, you know, why aren't you coming? And he said, because it's, you're, it's, it's too boring. It's too boring. <laughs> Never ask a seven-year-old. Because well, they'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Point one. But there should be some excitement, right? Yes. Now, you know, I'm not talking about Raspberry Day. You're always up jumping around. Mm -hmm. and, but somewhere inside of you, that fire Stern. has to be boring. Yeah, just... Because we're like little steam engines. Fire goes out, you ain't going no place. You're just going to sit and... And it can't be superficial either. No, that's what I'm saying. Real. Real. You can't have a bunch of leaves being thrown on the fire. It's got to be logs that have steady burn time. How's that? I, I, we'll call them Bob Rizzo. Okay. But, but the fact is, I mean, there should be that excitement in a believer. Why? Not because of what he did to you yesterday, but because he's an exciting guy. Because I mean, of who he is. Because of who he is. Yeah. That's not enough to excite you. You better go back and check your relationship with him because there's something wrong, okay? 
But it's sad to go into a, a, a fellowship and just see them all sitting around being bored. It really is. I mean, where is that movement of the Holy Spirit? Where is that, that rushing fire that came on the day of Pentecost? You know, is Pentecost over and done? I don't think so. I don't think so. And it doesn't matter. You know, please, this is not about being Pentecostal. It's about being an actual follower and believer in Jesus Christ and seeing his mighty hand at work in your own life. And if, you're, if God is at work in your life and you're not being excited by it, brother, get together with somebody to pray for you. But you have to fan the flames. That's, you know, that's, it's got to be that wind. And oftentimes, I mean, it's up, we have to fan that flame. To keep it to keep it going and glowing and growing, right? So the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And this is just a short little verse. But consider this. He said, Do not quench the spirit. To quench means to extinguish, to put out. That's exactly what it means. I mean, so there's a always remember there's a consistency to the word of God. Okay, what Paul talks about in this letter, he, you may get more clarity by reading what Paul said in this letter. And you may get even more clarity by seeing what Isaiah wrote 750 years before, or what God spoke through Joshua even hundreds. The, the Word of God is all connected, okay? And that's where your understanding of it should come from. Because the Greek word that's used there for quench literally means to extinguish. You know, it says, let a man examine himself. So I don't want to, I'm not going to sit here. I'm not, this is not the Inquisition. And I'm not going to examine you. However, I'll give you a suggestion. Maybe examine yourself and ask you, do you get more excited about going and watching your favorite football team after the services than you do when you're at the services? What excites you exactly? <laughs> I don't want to sound corny, but I'm never afraid to sound corny. And I'm going to tell you. My love excites me. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about you. <laughs> no, I mean it. It's like, what excites you? Good brothers and sisters should excite you. That kind of fellowship should be exciting. Because the world doesn't have that. Well, they can all get together and they can have a billion and a half friends on Facebook. It doesn't mean that they have a single friend. They don't have somebody... You know, there is one who is, sticks closer than their brother. His name is Jesus Christ. It's when you have that kind of fellowship. Because the Word of God says that, Behold how pleasant and becoming it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's pleasant. It's becoming. It's good. You know what's exciting is when, when we're in Bible studies and you see somebody that we're, you know, when we're studying the Word and they get it. It's like... A light goes on and they understand what's going on. That's a great thing to say. Yeah, and that, that is exciting. It is exciting. And when you see your brothers and sisters being obedient to the Lord and doing what He calls them to do, that's, that's exciting. That's even more exciting. Yes. All right? Because yes. there, there is getting of it. Yes. There's the knowing it, there's the understanding it, and then there's the doing it. Mm -hmm. And each one of those grows, and it'll grow your excitement. And that, when you see it, it, it encourages you. And it's just, it, it's like a flame that just keeps bouncing around and igniting us and getting us all. Well, I think anybody that knows anything about fire, especially wildfire, can tell you, you know, the thing is, it's contagious. Right, right. Now, that's the thing. It's going to spread. It's going to spread. It's going to spread. It's going to yeah. spread. Yeah. So where is that fire of the, of the believers that is spreading? Do you want some fire in your life? I mean, do you want some excitement in your life? Of course you do. Of course. I, 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 I'm talking to you. I mean, do you really? Do you want excitement? Yeah, are, you, are you tired of, of boring church? Are you tired of, of boring Christianity? You want some excitement in your life? Same old, same old. It is as simple as this. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And He is a consuming fire. Well, that's all I have to say on that. We're going to move along now to first, Second Timothy, verse seven, one, chapter one, verse seven. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Timidity. The King James says, "For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind." Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you 
Uh, I'm not reading from the New American Standard. And I will tell you that timidity, being timid, is a very, very good translation of the Greek. Because there's a difference between, and this may be something of a subtle difference, but there's a difference between timid, being timid and being fearful. Right. Okay. Yes, there is. Right. Timidity is the opposite of being bold. Right. And it says the wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. It's Proverbs twenty-eight one. So we're supposed to have that boldness. What it means is a lack of courage. Okay. But it's not so much a shaking in your boots fear, kind of fear, in dangerous situations, as much as it is being so timid so you avoid all those dangerous situations. You understand what I'm saying? And so it's like, okay, you're timid. You, you avoid those situations. You stay away from them. It's not not being afraid of them when they happen. It's being, being timid so you avoid them, all right? This is, this, you have to understand, there are lists of things in the Bible that, that are good. For example, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Go read it in Galatians 5. That's, that's a good list. Yes, okay. Is. There are six things, yea, even seven, it says in, in Proverbs chapter 6, that are an abomination to the Lord. Those are bad. Mm -hmm. But there are lists, okay? Mm -hmm. And I've always said God is a God of priority, so he's a God of good order. There's an order to things, all right? So think about this then. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. I'll read them, but go ahead and read them. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and old liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right? Revelation 21, 7 and 8. The first one on that list is cowards. That's right. Don't think that, because cowards, first and foremost, shows that you have a lack of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I, and I feel compelled to say something else here. Mm -hmm. There is a so-called translation of the Bible called the Message Bible. I was just going to say, if anybody's translation has feckless, you better get a new one. A new Bible. Well, that's the only one that I know of. What Alice is talking about, in, in theory, uh, the, the publishing company says that this translation, and it's not, you know, the, the publisher says it's not a translation, it's a Bible, right? Uh, they say that it was written by the fellow that did this to make it easier to read and easier to understand. Not that it was interesting with this particular verse, that the first word is not cowardly, the first word is feckless. Now, on my own, when I first saw this, when that Bible first came out, it just uh, challenged me. So I went out and I asked a number of people. And I asked people um, who I knew to be fairly intelligent, fairly well-educated. And I asked them, you know, you know the word coward means, right? And 100%, and right? I asked somebody, you know the word coward. I think maybe 99.5% said, yeah, I know what coward is. I said, well, do you know what feckless means? And these people that I asked, mostly college educated, like, no. Mm -hmm. So if this was meant to be easier to understand, why would you change the word coward into the word feckless? Which, by the way, is not the same as coward. Mm -hmm. Okay? It means being ineffective. It doesn't mean, okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, I do want, I want to make a comment and say I don't recommend that much. I, as a matter of fact, I don't even call it a Bible, but that's you know, that's between you and God. But be on guard. Okay. So, show you show me a man or woman who is walking in the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is something to be we are supposed to have. Show me a man or woman who is walking in the fear of the Lord, and I'll show you a man or woman who fears not man. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Think about David, a young man going out and facing Goliath. 
and not only facing them, but demeaning them, saying, you come to me with all your stuff, I come to you in the name of the Lord. You're no threat to me. And that proved to be the truth. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It says they were young men. And yet when they were compelled by the most powerful king on the face of the earth at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, to bow before his statue, to worship his statue, they said, no, we will not. We worship the most high God. Why do you know that? That's not, a, that's, that's not cowardly. No, it's not. That's courageous. How about Daniel going into the lion's den? How about Paul? Look at, I mean, what well, he, well, he went through. These people were not cowards by any means. And so many more in our times. Believe me, and people are being persecuted in our times. You never be, you know, uh, I, I, I do this all the time. I distract myself. But in John chapter 9, there's the account of a man who was born blind. A man that Jesus Christ heals yes. so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And if you read this, or please, if you don't know the account of this, go read it in John chapter 9, all right? But what happens is, after everybody notices the difference in him. He goes, oh, why not? He, all of a sudden, he's not sitting outside the, the gate of the temple and begging. Now, he's out there walking around and looking, seeing the sun for the first time in his life. He's making eye contact. He's seeing people for the first time in his life. Seeing he had a mother and father. He saw his mother and father for the first time in his life. And what happened was the Pharisees, they're basically enraged because Jesus did this. So they bring him in to question him. And as they're questioning him, they bring his parents in. They bring the blind man, the once blind man in. Yes, they brought, the, yeah, they brought the once blind man back in, in to question him. And then they bring his parents in. And they said, is this your son? Or is this, this is our son. But, you know, whether... Jesus healed or not, we don't know. I said, you know, this is really very obvious. If you're going to be prepared to stand for the Lord, you better be prepared to stand alone. Except for him who will never leave you nor forsake you. Except for the one that will walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you. But people, you better be prepared that people will abandon you. Okay? It is interesting that uh, when he was talking, he was so overjoyed at getting his sight back and what the Pharisees and Sadducees were saying to him, to him, did not matter in the least. No, I didn't. It's not really he. What mattered to him was what God had done. It's like, and God wasn't finished with what he had done. I mean, you go read John, John chapter 9. Okay, when they're on, it's too easy for me to want to get into that. Right? So then he goes on to talk about and power and love and sound mind. Discipline, right here in this verse. Mm -hmm. Well, power must always be tempered by love in order to be God. And that is a sound mind. Right? Discipline. How does God, are we disciples? Yes. What makes a disciple? Somebody who's been disciplined. You've been right. trained. Because the word discipline means to train. It doesn't mean to beat. Yeah. It doesn't mean to punish. Stop listening to the world and believing yes. lies. Absolutely. Discipline means to train. Train up a child in the way he should go and he will not depart from it when he's old. Okay? Sometimes you need this stuff. David was a man after God's own heart. David was the king of Israel. And yet David prayed and he said, Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. Psalm 141, verse 5. He prayed for discipline. He prayed. You know, God, send people who will bring that correction into my life. Because the word of God is, and Paul will write here later in 2 Timothy, he says it's, it's profitable for correction. It's profitable for training in righteousness. We have to get that attitude. Not that we're afraid to be disciplined, but that we desire to be disciplined. It's good. So, because as, don't reject it, desire it. Because the more you get dis disciplined, the more you are becoming a disciple, and the more Christ-like you will be. When, when I read this verse, you know, I don't see the 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 discipline happening from from the outside onto somebody else. 
but between you and God or with, within yourself. You become more self-disciplined or God disciples you. Well, it's both of them. Right? I mean, yes, both. But there's a third uh, from one to another, from one person to another. You have to understand that the origin of the old is God. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if he does it directly, those who mm -hmm. if he does it directly, or if he does it by using somebody else in your life, mm -hmm. the point is you have it's to always. God, because if you don't see it, it's coming from God. Now the first thing is, you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. It, it is normal and all too common for the enemy to come and accuse you of things. That's not discipline. Yeah. That's accusation. Okay. That's slander and accusation. And we don't have to fear that because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. But when somebody comes and, and says you're doing this wrong, test it and see. Because the chance, there's a chance, maybe they're right. And maybe you are doing that thing. And if you are, you should want that. You should desire that thing to be removed from you. And it's not like, take offense. It's like if you're building something and a, a, a buddy, a brother, comes along and says, hey, you know, you did this wrong over here. Are you going to get all upset with them? Are you going to get angry? Or are you going to check and say, oh, thanks, man, I'm for catching that? Mm -hmm. Okay? That should be our heart. Thanks for catching that. Because it should be our desire, day by day by day, to be more and more like Christ. Mm -hmm. I know that it's God's desire. It's not only God's desire, it's God's work. Because He is at work. But with the will and to work is good pleasure in our lives. And it says in Romans 8 that this is the great promise, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. that whom He foreknew, he for then he predestined to become conformed into the image of his son Christ Jesus. How is he conforming us into the image of his son Jesus? By removing all the stuff that's not Jesus from our life. Cutting it away. Cutting it away. And that should be our desire. If there's something in my life that is not God, cut it away. Get it out of my life. Amen. I'll tell you right now, we'll stop that cold pride. Pride, pride, pride is the enemy of the spirit. And if you think, you know, if somebody comes along and tells you you're doing something wrong, and you examine it, don't don't jump and don't attack, but examine it. If it's if it's not true, forget it. Forget it. Don't don't let it bother you. All right? You have an advocate with the Father. He knows the truth. He stands before the Father. The Father is not going to believe any of the lies of the devil. So don't don't worry about it. And if the world believes it. So what? The only one it says here in Second Timothy, <clears throat> Paul says, "Study, be diligent, and show yourself approved unto God." And last week we talked about faith, sincere faith. And we talked about the fact that the, the purpose of faith. It says, and everybody knows what Hebrews eleven one is. You know what Hebrews eleven two is? For by it men of old gained approval. It's about getting the approval of God. That should be our great desire. And that comes through him refining us. And oftentimes it's refiner's fire, baby. And that's what he's going to be looking for when he comes back. Yes. He has more on faith. And it's, it's likely, I, I would even say I'm hopeful, that at the rate we're going, we'll probably only be about two, two verses advanced before he comes back, which works for me. Hallelujah. Because we've already run out of time again. So, Father, we ask, we thank you for the precious time that you have given us, that we have each week to come together in your word. And, Lord, I pray that it's a blessing to all of us, and that each of us would indeed be refined by your word, Lord God, that we would see it as profitable for, for training righteousness, for correction, for reproof. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you use that word. You use your son, Jesus Christ, to train us to be more like him. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen and amen. See you next week and we'll get through another, at least one more verse. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank Jesus.